Please pray with me and for me. Most gracious Heavenly Father, it is you who have drawn each of us into this place this morning. And so we look to you, Father, to lead us, to guide us. I look to you, Father, to speak through me. For Lord, without you, I have nothing worth saying. Lord God, may every word that is spoken bring honor and glory to you and to your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. 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 Oh, this is going to cramp my style. Especially when I have a broken wing. <laughs> so, what's a lay leader? Huh. And you. who is yours? You. You. Excuse me. It's my turn. <laughs> it's taken me a long time, but I think I may finally be able to answer those two questions. Let's start where I started 32 years ago in the book of Exodus. Joshua did what Mo... Oh. Really? Joshua. Yeah, no, it's Exodus, but that's the NIV, and I have the message. Okay, I'll read this. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. It turned out that as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone, they being Aaron and Hur, they dragged over a stone and put it, him under, put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other. You see? so that his hands remain steady till sunset. Joshua defeated or overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, if we read the 17, that's for much later. <laughs> If we read chapter 17 from the beginning, we learn that, about the staff that Moses carried that day. This staff is the same one that God used to bring water out of the rock for the people of Israel when they were in the desert. Moses was carrying this same staff when he climbed to the top of the hill overlooking the battlefield. The staff is a symbol of supplication to God an appeal for God's help and enablement. It was not lightweight, this staff. It wasn't made of aluminum. It was probably at least five feet long, about that tall, and as big around as a man's hand could grip. And it was probably made from a hardwood, which would have made it rather heavy. When Moses raised his arms, one arm holding this staff, the Israelites would begin to dominate the Amalekites. They were winning by the power of God through Moses' intercession. But Moses grew tired. He was, after all, a very old man by this time. And the battle was long. His arms began to quiver. His shoulders began to ache. His fingers grasping the staff grew numb, and his arms dropped, and the Amalekites began to dominate. But Moses was not alone on that hilltop. Aaron, his brother, the priest, the repentant idolater, his right-hand man, his mouthpiece, was there with him, as he had been for all those years of wandering. 
Her was there, too. Not Ben Her of movie fame. Sure. This Her was probably the grandson of Caleb, who, along with Joshua, spied out Jericho. Um, these two dragged a stone over. They offered practical help for the old man. They dragged the stone over so that he could sit. And then each one took an arm and held it up. And they kept holding up his arms all day long until the battle was done and they had won victory. All leaders, especially spiritual leaders, need an Aaron and a Her, and I'm Her. People who share their passion, their vision, and their mission. People who can be trusted to know the leader's weaknesses and help him or her overcome them, rather than use that knowledge to undermine their ministry. People who are willing to do the hard labor of supporting the leader in practical ways, dragging over the stone so that he can sit, holding his arm up, holding that heavy staff. People, the leader needs people who are uh, willing to support him in prayer and in conversation as well, because there are things that leaders need to talk about that they have to be careful who they talk about. That was terrible, I'm sorry. Leaders need someone who will love them like a brother or a sister, including being brutally honest with them and open in all their interactions. People who are faithful and dependable. So I think this passage in Exodus gives us a fairly clear picture of lay leadership. But the Methodists have a method for everything. And when I was asked to consider accepting this position, I figured I'd better find out what the official job description is. The first place that I looked was in the guidelines booklet published by Cokesbury entitled Lay Leader, Lay Member. Now note in the title of that booklet, Lay Leader, Lay Member. We'll come back to that because every member of a Methodist church is expected to develop whatever leadership capabilities God has blessed them with for the kingdom work of the church. So the responsibilities of the lay leader are set out as follows in this guidelines book. Functions as the primary lay representative of the laity. So I'm like your delegate to the House of Delegates in Richmond. So, but I can't represent you if you don't tell me what you want represented. So, you have a part to play here, too. The lay leader fosters the role of the laity in mission and ministry. I am to encourage you, and I try every day, to encourage you to participate in the ministries of our church and the mission of our church. I meet regularly with the pastor. I'm a member of the charge conference, the church council, and other committees, like every committee in the church. And a few that nobody even knows about. They have meetings. A lay leader continues to be involved in study and training opportunities, which reminds me, how many of you have registered for the Lay Servant Ministries training that's occurring on the 29th and 30th of May? Right here. Three. Okay. I encourage you to take advantage of these training opportunities. 
The lay leader assists in advising the church council and informs the laity of training opportunities. Okay, I just did that one. <laughs> lay servant ministries training, you can still register. The Book of Discipline tells us that, quote, an effective lay leader functions as the primary representative and role model for Christian discipleship and faith lived out in the church and in daily life for the people of a congregation. The lay leader works with the pastor to fulfill the mission and vision of the congregation. That's the part that scares me. Role model for Christian discipleship and faith lived out because I'm not perfect and my I hesitate to hold myself up as a role model for anybody, let alone for the people of God. But here I am. These descriptions are open to interpretation, and for one new to the United Methodist Church, such as myself, more than a bit intimidating. When Pastor Carey first approached me about assuming this position here at Rising Hope, I read everything I could find on the subject, and I was humbled. Humbled that Pastor Carey saw in me the characteristics of an effective lay leader. And then I was afraid afraid that I wouldn't measure up, that I would disappoint Pastor Carey, or embarrass the church. But, as I prayed about my role at Rising Hope and about my role as its lay leader, the Lord took me back through the 34 years of experience and training that he provided to me to prepare me for this time and this place. A couple of years after I got serious about being a disciple of Jesus, I was called to be ordained a deacon in the Baptist church we were attending. In the Baptist tradition, deacons were considered to be servant leaders in the church, following after the example of Jesus recorded in Luke 22:27, where he asks his disciples, For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I, Jesus, am among you as one who serves. In fact, all disciples of Jesus Christ are called to follow his example of sacrificial servanthood. We have been declared a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, meaning that everyone who professes faith in Jesus Christ is called to be a minister of the gospel. There are no exceptions. Are you hearing what I'm saying, folks? Do you rightly understand that God, who called you in to rising hope, who drew you into his marvelous love expressed through the suffering servant, Jesus Christ, this same God is calling you to be a lay leader a servant leader in the church. One of the key roles in the, of the lay leader in the Methodist tradition is to model sacrificial servanthood to the laity and to encourage each member of the church to develop and refine their own gifts and talents to better serve the kingdom purposes of the local church. One of your key roles is also to model sacrificial servanthood. If we need more scriptural support for this concept, we can look to Jesus' example in John 13, verses 5 and 6. Jesus knew that the Father had put him in complete charge of everything, that he came from God and was on his way back to God. So he got up from the supper table, set aside his robe, and put on an apron. Then he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the feet of the disciples, drying them with his apron. It strikes me in this passage that Jesus knew that he had come from God and that he was on his way back to God. And we too, as disciples of Jesus the Christ, can know this same truth, 
that we have come from God. It is He who made us, who breathed life into us, who made His home in us when first we believed the Gospel. And we can know with great certainty that we are on our way back to God because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. This knowledge frees us from the petty needs of our egos for applause or accolades or affirmations, for self-promotion, the desire to be in the spotlight or to run the show. When we know for sure who we are in Christ and to whom we belong, for all of eternity, even the most menial tasks can be done for the glory of the one who made us, with no need or expectation of reward. We have heard very recently about the significance of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Folks didn't wear shoes back then. They didn't get a pedicure every week either. They wore sandals. Sandals? Not so different from the ones I'm wearing today. And except for the very privileged, they walked everywhere along dusty roads and dirty streets. And their nasty feet showed it. It was the custom of the lowest servant on the totem pole to be assigned the job of washing the guest's feet. It was an essential element of good hospitality, one that I am glad we no longer observe. <laughs> this particular example that Jesus gave us is a reminder that no task is too lowly for any one of us. If the King of Kings can wash the filthy feet of the disciples, then the day that we think that some task is beneath our dignity or we're too delicate to do dirty work, we've effectively removed ourselves from the roster of kingdom builders. If God has called you to clean toilets, then clean them till they shine and be grateful that you have been given a kingdom job. Our ushers demonstrate this kind of service every week as they make sure that the altar women are sacred. And the communion table is set up properly. Judy Maitland demonstrates this when, after a long day of work, she prepares dinner for the Wednesday night Bible studies. Miss Bella gives up her Wednesday and Thursday afternoons to pray for folks in the Amen. Empowerment Amen. Center. Amen. And I didn't even know you were going to be here, Miss Bella. <laughs> if you spend a few hours around here during the week, you will be able to observe numerous people from all walks of life demonstrating sacrificial servanthood at Rising Hope. Another example occurred during the Stamp Out Hunger food delivery last Saturday. Somehow, and we don't want to know how, some, <clears throat> I'm trying to be delicate, fecal material what? found its way onto the hallway floor downstairs. I kidded as I cleaned it up that I had not realized that this task was part of the job description for lay leader. <laughs> but it is. It's in the fine print, yes, as sir. my husband is fond of reminding me about our marriage covenant. There are all kinds of things he says are in the fine print. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it's but whatever needs to be done, the servant leader should be ready to step up and do it. Amen. The Baptist diaconate into which I was ordained in 1986 is also based on the early church described in Acts 6. Hit it, Goldie. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. 
So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles, who prayed and laid their hands on them. While the original seven deacons were assigned the task of distributing food to the growing church in Jerusalem, we must not fail to note that the apostles chose people who were full of the spirit and wisdom. The one chosen to lead these deacons was Stephen, who was later martyred for the faith, as witnessed by the as yet unbelieving Saul of Tarsus, whom Jesus renamed Paul. Again, we find God's perfect plan for his church being implemented as the laity step up to assist the pastors in all the spiritual and practical aspects of being the church. At Fair Park Baptist Church, deacons were expected to function as sort of assistants to the pastor, visiting the sick and shut-ins, taking communion to them, um, teaching in the church, helping to create community, leading in prayer and worship, very much like a lay leader in the Methodist church. Only the Baptists have more than one. <laughs> and done right, every Methodist church should have many lay leaders. Elder Walter Radney was my mentor. Ooh, you going to get the clunk here. <laughs> Elder Walter Radney was my mentor and a father to me. Amen. Amen. He was a soft-spoken man of God, humble and loving. He rests now in the arms of his beloved Savior. During my ordination into the diaconate, when Walter laid his hands on my head as I knelt before the altar, and he prayed for me, something inexplicable happened. I felt something like electricity, a warm, tingling sensation that started where Walter's hands were touching me. The feeling quickly spread throughout my body until I felt weightless. It was a truly transcendent and deeply meaningful experience, and I knew then, in that moment, that it was not Fair Park Baptist Church or Pastor David Small or the Board of Elders that had called me to be a servant leader in the church, but the Holy Spirit. And I know in my knower, you know where your knower is? Yeah. You know where your knower is? It's right here. You know that you know that you know in your knower that something is true. Just know in your knower. Okay? And I know in my note. The cat's what God wants me to be. A servant. I would much rather be a ser lay servant than a lay leader, to be perfectly honest with you. Okay. All right, come on. Did you know that tears correct astigmatism? <laughs> There's another element of my history that informs my concept of lay leadership, and that is my military experience. Paul draws a, a parallel between soldiering and following Christ in 2 Timothy, where he says, <clears throat> says, Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Amen. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs but rather tries to please his commanding officer. In the army, <clears throat> I learned that every leader must first be a follower. Everybody takes orders from somebody. Everybody's got a boss. Okay? 
And since I surrendered my life to God, my commanding officer has been Jesus of Nazareth, as he is revealed in the Gospel accounts and by the Holy Spirit. Jehovah Nisi is the banner under which this soldier fights. And that explains the single tattoo that you see here on my left shoulder. I know, Deuteronomy says don't do it. And that's what my mama told me. But you know what? Christ freed us from the law. Okay? This is the Hebrew letter Tsayin. And in <clears throat> the system of Jewish mysticism known as Kabbalah, a Tsayin is a woman warrior who forges a spiritual connection with God and enables those around her to do the same. Amen. I didn't get this tattoo until I was 59 years old. Amen. That's how well my mama taught me about Deuteronomy. <laughs> but to me, this is not a violation of God's commandments. This is a symbol of my commitment Amen. to God. I learned self-discipline in the Army. Because in the Army, in basic training, if you don't discipline yourself, mm. your platoon mates or your drill sergeant will discipline you. And it won't be pleasant at all. Being disciplined includes studying everything that you need to know to be a good soldier. No leader can expect to be followed if they don't know where they're going, how to get there, or what they're going to do when they arrive. <coughs> Jesus, again, provides the perfect example that we are to follow. He knew scripture by heart. The psalmist asked the Lord to inscribe his word on his heart, to make it an essential element of his very being. When Jesus was tempted in the desert, he responded to each temptation with scripture, words that were written on his heart. He wasn't carrying a holy Bible with him out there, folks. That word was written on his heart. He had memorized it as a child. And he carried it with him wherever he went. And it kept him from sinning against God. And we are to follow his example. Are you following his example? How much scripture have you memorized? Do you read your Bible daily? Do you attend the Bible studies that Rising Hope offers to deepen your knowledge and understanding of Scripture? Have you taken advantage of the many training opportunities that have been offered by the district or by lay servant ministries? You don't have to answer to me. You're going to have to give an answer one day. My pastor in Denver, Judy Horn, explained that lay leaders in the church functioned in much the same way as an armor bearer in ancient Israel. Continuing with the soldier motif. <laughs> an armor bearer was a trusted and competent soldier who was assigned to the commander for the purpose of carrying the commander's armor, helping the commander don that armor when necessary, and protecting the commander from attack or injury. The armor bearer was always by the commander's side, in battle or in garrison. Part of what I try to do as your lay leader is to help Pastor Kerry keep his spiritual armor in tip-top shape through prayer, counsel, and practical assistance. Together and with other leaders, we pray for you, the children of God at Rising Hope that you may become faithful disciples and lay servants. And we pray for each other that we may be fully surrendered to the Father's plan and used for his kingdom and his glory. Together and with others, we study the scripture. Together and with others, we plan how best to make disciples of those who come through the doors of rising hope. 
Now, I cannot leave you with the impression that I think I'm anywhere near an effective role model of Christian discipleship in the church and in daily life. God isn't finished with me yet. It takes a lot of pressure to make a diamond out of a lump of coal. And trust me, when Jesus picked me up, I was a dirty old lump of coal, and I'm no diamond yet. When I think of myself as a role model, I tremble. I'm not a very good one, as I was reminded last Sunday when one of my passengers for Sunday school yelled at a driver on my behalf. You see, she was just following my example. So, I hope and pray that you will forgive me when I fail, when I don't exhibit the character of Christ when I let my flesh, when I let the bad wolf out. And please, don't blame God for my bad behavior. And don't blame Pastor Kerry. It's all me. Okay? My mission, my passion for 34 years has been to share the love of God through Jesus Christ in whatever place he puts me, whether that's the D.C. metro area, Holland, upstate New York, southern Illinois, Colorado, or back in D.C. I am overflowing with gratitude to our Father for having brought Craig and me to Rising Hope. My vision and pastors are the same, to reach the lost, the lonely, the left out, and the least among us with the life-changing message of the suffering servant. To encourage those who have more to share with those who are in need in the name and for the sake of Jesus. To share the gospel, to heal the wounded, lift up the weak, guide the blind, love the unloved, just as Jesus. My covenant with God as a member of Rice Hope Mission Church and my covenantal promise to Pastor Perry and the people of Rising Hope is that I will prayerfully and faithfully do everything I possibly can to be a Christ-like leader. Toward that end, I ask you all to hold me up in your prayer to forgive me when I fail, and to renew your dedication to joining me in helping Pastor Dr. Dude lead this congregation into its third decade of teenage service.